Would you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 11? We'll be reading through the whole chapter together this morning, starting at verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through the trespass salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am seeking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch, I'm speaking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches." But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishment root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy, because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given him a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The reading of God's word. 
Good morning. Romans 11 is, uh, I mean, it's just one of the fun ones, right? Everyone knows what Romans 11 means already, so I'm just going to quickly skip through. (laughs) The vast majority of ethnic Israel had rejected the central element and saving hope of their religion, Jesus Messiah. This was because Romans 10.21, they were a disobedient and contrary people, constantly rejecting the generous invitation of God, and because instead of giving them faith, a new heart, eyes to see and ears which hear, God hardened the majority, Romans 11.8. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. So we have both these answers. So has God rejected his people? By no means. In the first 10 verses of Romans 11, which we looked at last week, Paul uses his own conversion and the existence of a faithful Jewish remnant as evidence that even though the majority were hardened and they did reject the gospel, God has in no way rejected ethnic Israel wholesale in any sort of corporate sense. Yes, the the many were not saved and died in their sins, but a remnant of Jews, Paul being one, did receive the righteousness of God by faith, as so many Gentiles were now experiencing. So the concept of a remnant, a a small group of survivors, was used negatively in Romans 9.27, in that of the multitude of Israel only a remnant of them will be saved. Now, in Romans 11, the remnant is seen in a very positive light. It is a pledge of God's continuing faithfulness to Israel and the promises that he has made to her. And now, in Romans 11.11, Paul turns from the discussion of Israel's past to contemplate her future. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they may fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? And so Paul has another question And again, another emphatic denial, by no means. God has hardened ethnic Israel. But the the potential inference we might make is that this hardening is permanent. Israel has stumbled in rejecting Christ and the righteousness of God offered through him. But their stumbling does not mean irretrievable spiritual ruin for, for the entire people group. Hardened Israel's stumbling has not resulted in her ultimate downfall because God did not intend that it do so. Paul understands ethnic Israel to be under the judgment which is described in Deuteronomy and Isaiah, which he quoted from in chapter 10 already, but in the context of both of those prophecies of judgment, this was not the final word for Israel. Moses wrote Deuteronomy 32, 21, They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And further along in the prophecy, God says of Israel, Deuteronomy 32, 26, I would have said, I will cut them to pieces. I will wipe them from human memory except that their enemies would misunderstand and think that they had been triumphant over his people. And so in the end, verse 26, the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone. In the prophecy from Isaiah 65, God relents from his judgment of Israel saying, for my servants' sake, I will not destroy them all. Isaiah 65, 9, I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it and my servants shall dwell there. 
And so Paul's prophecy in Romans 11 is not a new word, but rather a thoughtful exegesis of Old Testament scripture where God had predicted all along that Israel would continue to rebel. And yet rather than to reject his people and subject them to ultimate judgment, God chose to use Israel's sin uh, as the starting point of a process which will lead back to blessing for Israel. Ethnic Israel, thank you. The middle stage of this process involves the Gentiles. It is because of Israel's trespass that salvation has come to the Gentiles. Paul probably has in mind the way in which he and other preachers of the gospel were were rebuffed and spurned by the Jews when they came to bring them the message of the gospel. And so then they turned to Gentiles and found converts there. This final stage then comes as the salvation of Gentiles provokes ethnic Israel to jealousy. So there's this three-stage process. And it's actually repeated six times in Romans 11. This exact three-stage process is repeated over and over and over, making it one of the most emphatic points in any passage. Paul even adds verse 25, I don't want you to miss this. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, my brothers. God has hardened ethnic Israel, and he planned from before the days of Moses that the Jews would reject the gospel in large numbers. Paul has also sufficiently clarified that Israel's rejection of the gospel is sinful. Even if it was planned by God, they should have submitted to the message of the gospel, and they are culpable for their rejection of Jesus Christ. And under God's righteous judgment, the many in Israel received the retribution which was their due. But God has not rejected the people he foreknew, nor has he hardened that people group permanently. On the contrary, the lapse of Israel is part of God's all-encompassing plan and purpose. For by the means of their trespass, salvation has come to Gentiles like you and I. But God's saving purposes are not exhausted with the inclusion of the Gentiles. Sometimes we stop here. We say, the Jews rejected it. The Gentile received it. Praise God. But that is only step two of the three-step process that is introduced in Romans 11. God's saving purposes are, are not exhausted with the saving of the Gentiles. That was not his final purpose. Part of what motivated God's work among Gentiles was his desire to bring an end to Israel's rebellion by making them jealous. Paul wants Gentile Christians to recognize that God meant Israel's evil for their good. Israel's trespass, verse 12, means riches for the world. We should also recognize that God is now saving mostly Gentile people in order to bring blessing to ethnic Israel, even if they are temporarily hardened. And finally, we should see the significance for ourselves in Israel's restoration. Even greater riches, verse 12. If their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more would their full inclusion mean? Paul implies here that the blessing that will come to Gentiles at the time of Israel's inclusion will be much greater. And what is made implicit here is made explicit in verse 15 where he identifies this blessing as life from the dead. Verse 15, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? And so verse 15, again, it reiterates the three-point formula. Their rejection means reconciliation of the world. And then their acceptance will come after, right? The Greek grammar makes it clear that the rejection here is God's rejection, albeit temporary rejection of ethnic Israel. And the acceptance is God's future acceptance of the same. And so in this, verse 12 and verse 15 make nearly identical statements, but with a very different emphasis. Verse 12 stresses Jewish responsibility as sinners for their fate, their trespass, their failure. Well, in verse 15, the emphasis is on God's initiative in turning them away, 
Likewise, it is God's timing and initiative which will reinstate ethnic Israel into his favor. What would shock the Jewish audience was Paul's claim that the salvation of ethnic Israel would follow the salvation of the Gentiles. Most Jews believed that that some Gentiles would come to salvation after the majority of Jews. But Paul shows from the scriptures that Israel's hardening, verse 25, would last until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God's promises to Israel would establish a new world once Israel fully turned to him. Israel's repentance as a corporate entity signals the climax of history and and literally the, the physical resurrection of the dead will happen when ethnic Israel turns in whole in repentance to God. And only if that general repentance were delayed could Gentiles have the opportunity to turn to God at all. You see what God has done? He set out a promise in which when Israel comes in from exile, when Israel returns to their God, when Israel wholesale comes to repentance, that is when he will return. That is when the resurrection of the dead will take place. That is when he will remake the whole earth and and the cosmos. And so for a time, God has hardened the hearts from Paul's time till thankfully now hardened the hearts of of these people so that there would be an opportunity for Gentiles to come in, this second part of the process. This is why the extension of this temporary hardening of Israel is such a blessing to the remainder of the world. Because Israel's return from exile means the end of the opportunity for salvation. And if the sin of Israel has led to the riches of salvation for Gentiles and to reconciliation of the Gentiles to God, then Paul wants us to see that the effect of the conversion of the Jews will be even more astounding. It will mean unprecedented blessing. It means life from the dead. One of the key purposes in our passage this morning, as we will see, is to quell Gentile arrogance among the Roman Christians. Remember, we have this church that's Jewish and Gentile. They're trying to get along. And and both have their different reasons to be proud and put the other down. But we should begin to see here the way in which all Gentile believers are reliant on ethnic Israel for God's blessing. If we are chosen by God, then Israel's rejection is for our good in addition to God's glory. If we love God and are called according to his purpose, then Israel's repentance will also be for our good as well as God's glory. Paul addresses the next statement directly to the Gentile majority at the church in Rome. Verse 13, now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Insomuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. See, it's reiterated again and again. Yes, Paul was apostle to the Gentiles, but that does not mean he had forgotten or abandoned his own people. In fact, part of his motivation in pouring so much time and energy into reaching Gentiles with the gospel is so that as more and more of them turn to the Lord, the people of Israel will ultimately become jealous and also turn to the Lord. Paul's devotion to the Gentiles will ultimately have significant indirect impact on Israel. Now, verse 14 makes it clear that Paul does not think that every Jew will ultimately be saved. They were hard-hearted and impenitent, rejecting the gospel and killing the messengers. His hope was that through his ministry to the Gentiles, some of them will be saved. Then verse 16 introduces the metaphor of an olive tree. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. These statements, I think, function as an if-then if this, then that argument. Basically, just the way that the dough offered makes the whole harvest holy, the, the first fruits off, offering, then in the same way, if the root is holy, so are the branches. The, the first fruits offering 
eaten in thanksgiving before God, served as a representation of the whole of harvest provision. In, in Paul's writings, he usually uses this to signify an initial work of God that is a pledge of more to come. And the first fruits offering was taking that, that first bit of the harvest and, and eating it in thanksgiving before God with the expectation that a whole bunch more is going to come in afterwards. This is how this is used. In the same way, if you know what type is the root, you can be assured the branches which receive their sustenance from the root will be of that same type. If the root is holy, so are the branches. It's important to identify the tree in this metaphor. In the Old Testament, Israel is described as an olive tree. And because of this, Israel is quite often characterized as the olive tree God planted in later Jewish literature. Now, Jeremiah eleven sixteen to 17, the, the Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. But with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has decreed disaster against you because of the evil that the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done. Now, so the tree represents the people of God in the broadest sense, a people spanning both ages of salvation history and both major ethnic religious groups, Jews and Gentiles. And we can't take the metaphor too far to say that those in the tree are elect or, or truly saved. It's talking about those who are in that group, representing the very people of God. And the, the image of the root suggests the very foundation of the people of God. And this is most naturally understood to refer to the patriarchs and the promises given to them. And this interpretation is then confirmed in verse 28, which says that Israel is beloved for the sake of their forefathers. This concept finds many parallels in Jewish writings in which Abraham and the patriarchs of Israel are called a root or the root of Israel. Now, if the root is holy, uh, this, of course, does not mean that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob possessed any qualities that earned spiritual benefits for themselves and their descendants, only that, as both the Old Testament and Paul make clear, the patriarchs convey spiritual benefits to their descendants as recipients and transmitters of the promises of God. Their holiness consists in their having been set apart by God for this salvation historical role. So that the patriarchs were holy, not in that they were perfectly righteous and they'd earned God's blessings, but they were holy because God set them apart and gave them these wonderful promises that they would then convey to their descendants by faith. Ethnic Israel is not entirely rejected, even though they entirely rejected the gospel, because of the promises made to their patriarchs. God would always sustain some offspring of Abraham as his people. And so Paul's answer as to whether Israel is a part of the people of God is both yes and no. Okay? Some in, no, no individual Israelite can presume on God's election since God has always chosen some Israelites and not others. They have been broken off. Yet it, it is also the case that he does not reject the people of God, Israel, corporately. He has promised to save the great majority of the end time generation. So individuals who reject Jesus will be rejected. But that does not mean that God rejects the people wholesale. It would be to say like, well, I know some Christians who are hypocritical and bad, and God probably hates Christians. And you'd be like, well... Okay, so there are some, some people who call themselves Christians who are not true Christians. God rejects them, but you, you can't say that that represents all Christians and therefore God hates all Christians. That, that's taking it too far. The same thing's being said here. So are individual Jews the people of God, every one of them? No, because if they reject Jesus, they do not belong to God. He is the only way to salvation. Has God rejected ethnic Israel? No, they are the people he has foreknown, the people he chose for himself, they are the descendants of Abraham. Romans eleven seventeen. But if some of the branches were broken off, 
And you, though a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. You see what Paul's getting at here. This conflict in the church, this on, on cultural and ethnic divide, he, he's breaking this down over and over again. It, it, Paul masterfully combines theology and the practical outworking of it all the way through Romans. Paul is still speaking directly to Gentile believers, and what a shocking lesson he has for us. Yes, it is true that some of the natural branches, and indeed most ethnic Israelites, have been broken off. As Romans 9, 6 says, they have descended from Israel, but they are not Israel. And this circumstance, ordained and meticulously crafted by God, has made it possible for Gentiles to be grafted into the tree. Having Jewish branches cut away has provided space in the analogy, space in the tree for Gentiles to become part of the family of God in the illustration. This should not, though, lead Gentile believers to think they are better than Jews, that they have somehow had this internal morality or some proclivity to faith that the Jews did not have. Paul has been arguing all along that salvation is through the gracious choice of God and not based on any merit on the part of those who God chooses to save. The the Gentiles, they've, they've come to faith. And the Jews, they've rejected Jesus. They've walked in unbelief. Do they have something that they can brag about? No, faith is the gift of God. Do they have something they can look down their noses at the Jews that have, have not had faith? No, God has hardened them. Both of them would rebel against God. Both of them had rebelled against God. Later, it will say that God had consigned all to disobedience so that only those who are being saved will only be saved by grace so that no one can boast. But more than just to remember that salvation is through the gracious choice of God and not based on their merit, The Gentile believers also need to remember that the tree of which they are now a part has Jewish roots. Their savior is a Jewish Messiah. The first believers were Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. They have now become children of Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. They now have a new identity, a Jewish identity. So Gentile believers should be grateful to Jewish believers, not arrogant or condescending because of the ongoing rebellious state of Israel as a nation. Only God's grace and through God-given faith have they been grafted in amongst the Jewish Christians to be supported by the nourishing root of the olive tree. Now, It's also exciting that Paul confirms in this that Gentile believers, you and I, are not saved but second-class citizens. Gentile believers are grafted into Israel as full members. They are, Romans 4.16, the spiritual children of Abraham. They are, Romans 2.20-29, the spiritually circumcised. But such a status does not give Gentile believers, you or I or the believers in Rome, any right to look down on Jews who have broken the covenant by rejecting Jesus and his gospel. Because the early church had grown far beyond its its original Jewish element and the vast majority of Jews were rejecting the gospel, Jewish believers were apparently convinced that they belonged to a new people of God and that God had simply replaced Israel. They assumed that any Jews who did believe could become a part of their new community and on their terms, as we will see later in chapter 14 and 15. Jewish exceptionalism, Jewish pride of place, which Paul dealt with thoroughly in earlier chapters, was being replaced with Gentile exceptionalism. They boasted about their superior position or their own spiritual accomplishments. They boasted that they had had faith when the Jews had not. That must mean that they're superior as a race. Of course not. Both sets of boasting are clearly out of place. The 
olive tree metaphor makes it clear that the Gentiles' very spiritual existence depends on their partaking of the tree whose indispensable nourishing roots are planted in the soil of Jewish patriarchs and promises and to which the Jews even more naturally belong. No one can boast. Jew and Gentile alike fulfill roles in God's plan, each supporting the other, each playing a part in the salvation of the other, and all are reliant on the gracious election of God who grafts or regrafts them into the nourishing root. Verse 19, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Gentile Christians rightly rejoice in the fact that they have had the opportunity to be saved because of Israel's unbelief. But this reality should not lead them to be proud, as if they are somehow better than ethnic Israel. Instead, it should lead them to be afraid, lest the same thing happen to them. We are reminded of a a critical biblical principle here in which Paul uh, states clearly in 1 Corinthians 10 when speaking of Israel's judgment. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, and then I'm going to read verses 11 and 12 for the sake of time. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And then verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So when Christians read through the Old Testament and we see the accounts of Israel's perennial sin and Israel's continual rebellion, our response should be, Lord, please protect me from such rebellion in my own life. We can't just point fingers and be like, yeah, like they were pretty dumb. Look how, look how quickly they forget all of God's, the wonderful things God's done. We need to, to realize that this is our story. This is the story of our people, and we are exactly like that. And so we are totally reliant on God's grace. We're totally reliant on God giving new hearts, eyes to see, ears to hear. Because Israel couldn't do it for themselves, and and neither can we. And so our our response is, God, protect me. Keep us from temptation. Deliver us from evil. And we should take steps to guard ourselves from unbelief. We must fear God. We must be very careful, verse 20, to stand fast through faith. And what will motivate us to persevere in faith? It tells us the kindness and severity of God. We must reflect, church, on the kindness and severity of God. The kindness of God cannot be truly appreciated as a gift of His grace unless the severity of God is contemplated as the just penalty for forsaking Him. Paul attacks the notion that anyone would somehow avoid judgment merely because of their identity with a certain community. This is precisely what many Jews believed. And Paul has has already devastated the idea that one's birth or rituals would guarantee their salvation. He insists in the strongest possible terms that no one can presume upon God's grace and imagine that blessing will be theirs regardless of their failure to continue in faith. We can never conclude from Paul's teaching on divine election that he downplayed the necessity of human beings continuing to exercise faith in order to be counted righteous on the last day. You might say, well, what about all the claims in the Bible where Jesus says he's not going to lose any of those the Father has given him, that all his sheep will be rescued because he's the good shepherd? Yes, 
But ultimate salvation is always depicted as dependent on continuing in faith. This is the very reason for the example of Israel from the Old Testament, that we take heed lest we fall. Paul has already said, Romans 8.13, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And in Colossians 1.22, he says that you will be presented holy and blameless, above reproach before God. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. The author of Hebrews 3.6 tells us that we are God's house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And that Hebrews 3.14, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And Jesus taught his disciples, Matthew 10.22, Matthew 24.13, Mark 13.13, John 6.27, all have the exact same words, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Dr. Cooley writes, we dare not use our preconceived theology to overrule the word of God. Instead, we need to recognize that God is calling us to live our lives from a particular perspective. Yes, we are saved by grace, but that salvation brings about a transformed life. If we descend into unbelief, as Israel did, we have no basis for claiming that we belong to God or will be saved in the end. God's kindness, Paul has already written, is meant to lead you to repentance. You must continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Now, this does not mean at all that it now all depends on us. After all, it is God, 2 Peter 1, 3, who has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. It is God, Philippians 2.13, who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And it is God, 1 Peter 1.3, who has caused us to be born again. But none of these beautiful truths remove from us our responsibility to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12. Although our salvation flows out of God's gracious, unconditional election. This does not mean that we are merely passive recipients of that final salvation. We are called to live by faith. And if we choose disobedience and unbelief, we cannot expect any better of an outcome than Israel has experienced. Verse 23. And if they if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? You see, here there is no grafting or regrafting of any individual apart from faith. Paul has already clarified that the Jews were unsaved and individually cut off from the people of God precisely because they did not have faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way by which Jews can now be saved apart from faith in Christ. They will be grafted in again only if they do not continue in their unbelief. Verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer shall come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sin. For Paul, a mystery refers to a hidden element of God's plan. 
Not, not a secret that no one had heard because it could be seen clearly in the scriptures, but a mystery that most had failed to understand. And so what is the critical point Paul wanted them to understand? Israel's present hardening could suggest an imbalance in God's treatment of ethnic groups, as if he preferred Gentiles to Jews now. The last day, however, will reveal that God has treated all equally. For God, verse 32, consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Nearly all Gentiles before Christ's incarnation, nearly all Jews since Christ's coming, so that God could have mercy on all. Gentiles in the present age, Jews making up for their small numbers now in greater numbers at the end of the age. This mystery also relates to the Gentiles, in that the period in which salvation will be available to Gentiles will not last forever. Paul confirms here a concept from, from other Jewish writings which put forward the idea that there are a fixed number of people whom God has destined for salvation. And Paul reiterates this point several times. The full number of Gentiles destined by God will be saved. And this will be matched when Israel's hardening is removed and the full number of ethnic Israel is saved. A biological connection to Abraham, Paul has said, Romans 3, 9, is of no value when it comes to salvation. But neither is it a detriment if God has hardened Israel so that fewer among that ethnicity have come to faith in Christ, it will not serve as an ultimate disadvantage. Romans 2.11, for God shows no partiality, which means, in part, that God is not a racist. Now, I'm running out of time, but the theologically excited here are waiting for how I'm going to handle verse 26. In this way, all Israel will be saved. This is a highly debated passage, and if we take into account everything else Paul has said here, there is really no problem with the various interpretations. Uh, personally, I've bounced around through some of these versions uh, of at least three different views, and any one of them would fit well with what the rest of Scripture teaches. So none of these are a horrible interpretation. It's not impossible that all Israel refers to the true people of God composed of both the full number of Jews and Gentiles. Remember, Paul has said, Romans 9, 6, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So there is a, is a distinction between every ethnic Israelite and true Israel of some sort. And so it, it, it's not unlikely that this refers to the full number of Jews and the full number of Gentiles. All of them will be saved, and in this way, all Israel, all true Israel will be saved. This view can be seen in the very early church, and it became especially widespread in the post-Reformation period, and it, and it certainly fits with Paul's theology and the regular use of the term Israel in his other writings and in the rest of the New Testament. Usually in the New Testament, Israel refers to all the people of God, both Jew and Gentile alike, all those who are grafted into true Israel, Jesus Christ. And if this were any other part of Paul's writings or the New Testament, this would be my understanding. But Paul has used the term 10 times so far in Romans 9 to 11, and each time, with, with the possible exception of just one occurrence in, in Romans 9, 6, it refers specifically to ethnic Israel. And so to use it this time with a different meaning is unlikely and would be pretty poor communication. So Paul uses Israel in two ways in Romans 9, 6. Not all who descended from Israel, ethnic Israel, belong to Israel. And another interpretation says this second Israel, they belong to Israel or the elect remnant of chapter 11, verse 5. And in this interpretation, that this second usage of Israel is the elect remnant, verse 26 is saying that all elect Israel will be saved which is also true, if a bit of a pointless truism, to say all the saved will be saved, maybe that's what he's saying. All, all elect Israel will be saved. Again, there's nothing wrong with this interpretation. 
It fits with what Scripture teaches, and it could be Paul's meaning. The third possibility, and one which is more popular today, is that Paul expects a day when the majority or the corporate entity of ethnic Israel returns in repentance to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is also certainly true from what we read in the remainder of chapter 11. So, not in any way a problematic reading. The only wrong way then, in my opinion, to interpret this statement is to say that all ethnic Israel will be saved on the basis of their bloodline, which Paul has defended against over and over again in Romans, and so this would be a very foolish interpretation indeed. That's all I have to say about that. Romans eleven twenty eight to 32. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience... So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. See how it's it's reiterated over and over again, these three points. Now Israel and the church were not on friendly terms. As far as the church is concerned, ethnic Israel at large were enemies of God's people. They hunted them, they persecuted them, and they prayed curses upon them as Paul had once done. But this current hardness should not cause the church to see them as rejected by God as a whole. God still has a plan for ethnic Israel on account of his love for the patriarchs, for God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. God made a covenant with his people, and he made promises to save them as a nation. In his electing grace, he will keep that covenant and will bring about the restoration of the Jewish people. God chose the Jews as his people, and the purpose which he had in view can never be altered. It was his purpose that they should be his people forever. And for that to take place, there must be a future restoration and their inclusion in his kingdom. This covenant of God will be fully and finally accomplished. And God has made this super clear throughout the Old Testament by his prophets. He laid out the plan thousands of years ahead of time so that everyone would see his meticulous providence in all of these things. Can you imagine? We think this a long time ago that Paul lays out these three steps. Paul's pointing us back to Isaiah and Moses thousands and thousands of years ago so that we could see how meticulously God controls everything, that he hardens hearts and then he softens them and he hardens them for a time so that some Gentiles that are elected by God will be saved and, and then he softens hearts so Jewish people who are elected by God will be saved. God has spoken through his prophets. He laid out the plan. Ethnic Israel was given a blessing. They rejected the blessing. And they were disobedient. And so God's mercy was given to disobedient Gentiles. Which in turn will cause ethnic Israel to receive God's blessing through faith in Christ Jesus alone. The expected order of things was reversed. Showing that the salvation of both Jews and Gentiles is the result of God's grace alone. Israel will somehow appreciate and praise the mercy of God with a depth that would have been impossible if they had preceded the Gentiles. The inclusion of the Gentiles before the Jews reminds all that God works in unexpected ways and that no one at all deserves his saving grace. In addition to the warning to us as a church and the command to stand fast through faith, we are reminded again and again of the three-stage plan of God for the salvation of all his people, Jew and Gentile alike. All believers will desire to see the plan of God unfold, and we should all grow in our compassion for all of our eternal brothers and sisters, Jew and Gentile alike, who have not yet received faith in Jesus Christ. We know that God's plan 
is to save individuals as Christians obey and proclaim the gospel. This is Christ's command to all who call him Lord, Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. When it comes to reaching the nation of Israel, the people group, with the gospel though, we should recognize that God tells us ahead of time his plan for saving Israel. God's plan for saving Israel is made clear six times in Romans 11, pointing back to the various times in the Old Testament which the prophets shared this same plan, the mystery that is now revealed. Once the fullness of the Gentiles has been saved, then all Israel will be saved. So a big part of our strategy for reaching ethnic Jews should be the same as Paul's strategy. Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. After unveiling the three-stage plan of salvation for Israel, Paul follows with a doxology of praise to God, given in response to everything that he has said in the excursus of Romans 9 to 11, that book within a book. The threefold plan is followed with three exclamations about God's wise plan. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Followed by three rhetorical questions that emphasize that no human would have ever figured this out if God had not graciously revealed it. How unsearchable are his judgments How unscrutable his ways, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And these sets of threes are followed once again by three statements about the ultimacy of God, which finally calls forth a final doxology. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, a dense and and sometimes difficult part of the Bible, Romans 9 through 11, which is actually abundantly clear and repeats itself over and over and over and over again so that even if we're slow, we will pick up what it is that you are teaching to your church. This is what Paul says he desperately wants us to know. He does not want us to be unaware. And God, may we recognize now the grace that is evident in this saving plan. May we rightly honor you and give you thanks for who you are and what you have done. May we, like Paul, be given to doxology, praise, because of what you've revealed about your nature, your character, and your plan for salvation. What meticulous control, what sovereign power, what a great God, and no one else has done anything to add to it. We we have done nothing except for be used by you and be saved by you and be blessed by you. The whole world can say that they have been blessed by God in some way, but some few, God, though they reject you, though they are disobedient, though they are sinners, you still save for your glory because you have promised to do so, because it is your very character and nature. And so, Lord, we give you praise for this, and I pray that each one of our hearts would be stirred to glorify you as you deserve, worship you in spirit and in truth. And may we respond now in this praise that is born by your spirit and begun by your word honoring you as God. In Jesus' name we pray for his glory. Amen.